Hello. Uh, hope everyone can hear me and this is working. Um, my name is Karina and I'm the sales manager at Between the Lines. If you aren't acquainted with us, we are a social movement nonfiction press founded in 1977 and we're situated in Toronto, Canada, traditional Wendat, Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory subject to the Dish with One Spoon Treaty. This land was stewarded by the Mississaugas of the Credit River and is home to many Indigenous peoples, including the Métis and those displaced from their homelands by Canadian extractive and other industries. Um, I'd like to really thank you all for gathering here for the Zoom event and supporting independent publishing. Uh, we're sold out, which is really gratifying to see in a year like this. Um, it's been really lovely to do virtual events through the spring and summer and fall and see how much support there is for getting books like this out into the world. So uh, thank you for coming. Um, which brings me to the reason we're here, uh, which is Jeannie's Demise, Abortion on Trial in Victorian Toronto by Ian Radforth. It was published this past October and it's available from everywhere books are sold. But if you order from our website, uh, btlbooks.com, before the 25th, you can get it for 30% off for our holiday sale. So I'm gonna drop a link in the chat once we get going for that. Um, the author Ian Radford has joined us today. Uh, he's professor emeritus in the Department of History at the University of Toronto. He's a Canadian social historian and the author of several history books. And he's joined by a really great panel lineup we have tonight, um, Karen Dubinsky, Professor of History and Global Development Studies at Queen's University. She's the author of many books, including Cuba Beyond the Beach, Stories of Life in Havana, which BTL also published. We have uh, Carolyn Egan, uh, President Steelworkers Toronto Area Council and President United Steelworkers Local uh, 8300. And uh, she is a prominent activist in the women's and reproductive justice movements. We have Adam Bunch, who is a historian and creator of the Toronto Dreams Project, as well as the author of the Toronto Book of the Dead and host of the Canadiana documentary series. And uh, we're very happy to be joined today by our moderator, Franca Yacoveta, who's a professor of history at the University of Toronto and a Canadian feminist historian of women and gender. So uh, clearly we're in very, very capable hands for this event. Um, I'm really happy to turn it over to Ian to talk a little bit about Jeannie's demise and then we'll get into more of a roundtable panel discussion and there will be time at the end for questions so I really encourage you to make use of the Q&A feature um, right at the bottom right um, of your Zoom screen and uh, ask any questions and hopefully we can get to them all. So I'm going to turn it over to Ian now. Well thanks Karina. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I appreciate also the involvement of our panelists. I look forward to their comments. And a special thanks to Franca for organizing this event. Researching and writing this book was a retirement project for me. For the first time, I set out to write a book uh, that is non-scholarly, that I hope will uh, interest a wide audience. Very early in the process of casting about for a suitable topic for such a book, I came across the 1875 Toronto trial of husband and wife abortionists, Arthur and Alice Davis. They were charged with the murder of Jeannie Gilmore, who died as a result of the abortion Arthur performed. It immediately struck me that this was an interesting topic that I should take up. For one thing, it was well documented in the records of the uh, uh, Crown Office, um, uh, the prosecutors, but even more important, it uh, involves a, a topic about which historians haven't written a great deal. That is uh, the history of abortion, the social history of abortion in 19th century Canada. Um, abortion was illegal in 19th century Canada and for many decades afterwards. Um, and that didn't mean that there were no abortions, of course. It meant that 
uh, abortions were driven underground, that they were conducted in secret. And that makes it difficult for historians because it means that uh, very few or no records were created in the vast majority of instances of abortion. However, in a few cases, uh, an abortion led to the death of the woman and that brought uh, police, uh, the courts, and the press into the story. And they, of course, created all kinds of records. And that's the case with this story involving Jeannie Gilmore. Um, I chose to focus uh, nearly the whole book uh, on this one case because I thought it would allow me to uh, get into some detail and to give a flavor of the place and times. Um, Jeannie's demise, uh, the book looks closely, uh, as closely as possible into the characters of the story. Uh, we le learn about uh, Jeannie Gilmore and her family, their uh, emigration from Scotland just a few years uh, before Jeannie's death. We learn about her father, who was an earnest evangelical and became a, uh, an ordained minister in the Baptist church. Uh, we learn about the uh, struggle of the family to establish a bush farm in Northern Ontario in the Parry Sound district. And we learn something about Jeannie's life as a servant in rural homes and then in the home of a reasonably wealthy family in Toronto. In 1875, at the time of her death, Jeannie was single and 23 years old. The book also tells readers about the abortion providers in this case. Arthur Davis learned his trade from his father who ran an illegal abortion practice in Hamilton, Ontario. Arthur himself had many brushes with the law. He um, got involved in a, a, a large number of larcenies. He was unschooled in medicine and unlicensed to practice medicine. Uh, nevertheless, he had a medical practice uh, very near the center of Toronto at the time in the St. Lawrence neighborhood. In 1873, Arthur married Alice Chapman, a respectable church growing young woman from uh, rural upstate New York. Um, she proved to be a remarkably strong and resourceful woman who moved smoothly from her quiet rural life uh, to city work in Arthur's abortion practice. Uh, she took charge of, of situations there, uh, very often because Arthur uh, had a drinking problem and he was so drunk he couldn't uh, uh, handle the business at many points. He was probably very drunk, uh, sad to say, at the time he performed the abortion on Jeannie. The book introduces various minor players, uh, the night watchman and the uh, uh, detectives who played a part in the apprehension of the Davises and the laying of the murder charges in the case of the police. We learn about the lawyers who prosecuted and defended them, um, the men uh, who were charged with crimes uh, after the Davises confessed to their crime. I tried to give a sense of the flavor of life in Victorian Toronto, um, uh, the places where events took place like the police court and the uh, uh, county court. Um, we also get a sense that it was a walking city where, at least in the center of town, people recognized one another and were very aware of each other's presence on the street. It seemed like a small town still in the center of Toronto. But at the heart of my story is the tragedy of Jeannie's demise. The book serves as a reminder of how desperate women were who, like Jeannie, found themselves pregnant out of wedlock. It demonstrates the risk they took by turning to the unschooled people who sought to profit from women's distress at a time when everyone, including licensed physicians, were prohibited by law from performing abortions. There are obviously, I think, important lessons for today um, at a time when uh, 
women's ability to choose is constrained by access barriers in many parts of Canada and when the basic right to choose is increasingly denied in the United States. That's all I'll say for now. Um, I'll hand it over to Franca. Okay, thank you, uh, Ian, for those uh, opening comments. I uh, am going to act as moderator of the panel and uh, the panelists are gonna speak in the following order. We'll have Karen first, then we'll have Adam, and then we'll have Carolyn. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to Karen. Thank you, Franca. Thanks to Between the Lines for this invitation. Um, and thanks to Ian Radforth for writing such a compelling and interesting book. I've been looking forward to this discussion for some time. Um, I want to focus on a couple of things that I particularly liked about the book, things that really struck me. Um, then I'll become full nerdy historian for a moment towards the end and speak about um, archives and the sources that Ian used uh, to, to write this terrific book. But I'm gonna start with a little story, um, a story that is actually seared in my memory. It's something that took place in the early 1990s when I had just arrived at Queen's University's history department to take a position there. Two older male colleagues, um, and I don't actually really need to say male because that's kind of who was around in those, in those days, uh, were standing, hanging around outside the department office uh, by the mailbox. Um, and they were talking together and I heard one of them congratulate the other for an upcoming talk that he was supposed to be giving in a kind of an odd jokey way. And he actually, it actually to my ear, almost sounded a little bit rude. Um, the colleague who received this slightly backhanded compliment just laughed and he responded by saying something like, well, you know, this is supposed to be a popular talk. So, you know, and then they both chuckled and uh, the, the, the one giving the talk kind of shrugged his shoulders. They chuckled and uh, I realized something important at that moment. Uh, about the rules of the game into this um, institution or this profession that I had just joined. Among serious historians, popular means no big deal. It means nothing to worry about. It means nothing to take seriously. And it certainly is nothing to be praised for by one's peers. That story stayed with me, um, I think, because to me, at that moment, it became an example of how not to be, the way I didn't want to conduct myself. Like many of the things we learn when we work in institutions, there's all kinds of negative examples that can be just as instructive as the positive ones. So really, thank you, Professor Radforth, for ignoring academic disdain for the popular, um, for realizing that there's no contradiction between rigorous research and popular accessible writing and storytelling because this book really is an example of the delights of historical storytelling. Thanks also incidentally and this is you know more than incidentally to Between the Lines for continuing to believe in the capacity of Canadians to tell interesting historical stories. I also want to offer praise for storytelling at the local level and I won't say too much here because I think others will address this too. But Jeannie's demise is, despite the painfulness of the subject matter, a really fascinating excursion through 19th century Toronto. And Ian, um, Ian uh, mentioned this already. This Toronto, of course, contains the usual landmarks of grand houses and churches and promenades, but it also helps to transport readers back to other realities, the lives of young domestic servants, policing procedures, and of course, abortionists. This is not exactly the stuff of historical walking tours, for, um, for, uh, which is about all there really is left uh, for the imagination of this era. This is the kind of story that I think could become easily become a film. 
Last week, I happened to spend um, a week in Toronto helping my kid move into a new house in, uh, in Cabbage Town, coincidentally, not too far from where some of these events took place. This is a neighborhood that I didn't know well, don't know well from uh, the times that I have lived in Toronto in the past. So I was even more pleased uh, that my imagination had already been revved up by having read Ian's book not too long uh, ago. But the lo local history that this book extends, uh, but the local history, sorry, of this book extends past Toronto to Kingston, where I do live. Ian follows Arthur and Alice in and eventually out of Kingston Penitentiary. I was really fascinated to learn that when Alice was released, she joined her family um, running a corner store for decades at the corner of Division and Queen Street in Kingston, right next door to a daycare center which we had looked at for my kid almost two decades ago. That a woman, an infamous um, abortionist, someone who had escaped the death penalty, could leave Kingston prison and become a storekeeper for decades after her release, um, actually until her death in the 1940s. Um, a store that incidentally was located next to a school, that, which is now the daycare center. All of this to me puts a really different spin on Kingston's local history as well. How were abortion providers considered by regular folks? How long did Alice's unsavory uh, reputation last after, after her release? from prison? Did she, did she bear an unsavory reputation after her release? More generally, how were ex-convicts regarded in the past, particularly in prison towns like Kingston? Alice Davis is not the only ex-con to set up shop in Kingston after her release, I am sure. Um, and this seems to me to be another book waiting to be written. So finally, let me end with a few words about archives. The story of Jeannie, Arthur, and Alice live on, the stories, I should say, of the three of them live on in the case files of two levels of criminal courts, the criminal indictment files where the, the case would have been heard initially, and then because it involved the death penalty, uh, the capital case files, which is another level of government, the federal level, uh, who uh, were tasked with reviewing these kind of proceedings before they put convicted criminals to death. Criminal case files are really rich sources. They are full of vivid details about the lives and problems and mistakes and violence inflicted by and on women and men in the past. So Ian joins a host of historians who've used criminal case files uh, to tell stories, especially stories about sex, stories that are difficult to know about in the past, about abortion, about rape, homosexuality, prostitution, infanticide and incest, to name just a few. There's a list of historians that go along with those categories, too numerous now to mention, scholars who've written books and articles about literally each one of these criminal categories. All of this work, and this is stuff that's been published over the past few decades, has given us some really important insights into sexual relations and sexual conflicts in the past. What Ian has done, which really bears emphasizing because it's quite rare, um, is to take one crime, an abortion that resulted in death, and research the hell out of it in order to say something about the lives of the protagonists beyond the crime itself, which is of course what made the story a story in the first place. That's the only reason we even know about it. This crime was sensational and was much commented upon in the press, but this book includes a quite amazing amount of information um, about, uh, about you know, everyday people, the lives of uh, Scottish immigrants, poor Scottish immigrants who arrived in 1870s Ontario, the employment options and experiences of their young daughter, Jeannie. Even the detail of Arthur and Alice's abortion practice were not exactly available for the historian's eye without a great deal of digging. Some of you are probably familiar, no doubt familiar with the Nigerian writer Chimamanda Adichie's famous TED talk. Uh, it's called The Dangers of a Single Story. I've used this for teaching for years. I'm sure many of you have as well. It's a very simple but powerful message 
about avoiding stereotypes about other people um, and cultures. In other words, by not relying on a single story of, of whatever. As I was reading Ian's book, I kept thinking that there can actually be a lot of power in a single story. Uh, Jeannie Gilmore was not the only woman to have died from a botched abortion, past or present, but in her single story, artfully researched, we can see the connections between her story and the much broader word, uh, world of patriarchal politics generations later. This world of sexual politics, where sometimes women pay with their lives, isn't the same now, but it's not as different as I think we all hope it will become. Thank you, Karen, very much for that. Um, I wanna encourage people to use the Q and A uh, function if you wanna put forth some questions. We've got uh, a, a couple come through already and I'm um, gonna follow those fantastic remarks by Karen by turning things over now to Adam. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk a bit about the book because uh, I do I echo Karen. It's a wonderful book that brings uh, the story so much to life. Uh, and you do hear so often from people who aren't, uh, you know, giant history nerds or immersed in history every day uh, that it can sometimes be hard uh, to engage with. Uh, when it's presented uh, more as, you know, dry lists of events and facts and names. Uh, and Jeannie's demise, I think, is a great job of bringing that one story to life and the broader context around it, uh, that it is uh, immersive storytelling uh, that gets to tell its own story so well and so deeply while also exploring some of those broader themes. Uh, and very selfishly for me, uh, it came at a particularly interesting time because I've been thinking a lot about scandal and sex and uh, ideas of morality in Victorian Toronto uh, in my own work, uh, a book I've got coming out next month, the Toronto Book of the Dead, or sorry, the Toronto Book of Love. Uh, so I thought I'd talk uh, a little bit about some very broad context of what was happening in Toronto at the time uh, and sort of the origins of it uh, that uh, gets touched on a bit by the book uh, that hopefully helps uh, contextualize it a bit and gets people even more excited to read it. Because uh, the first thing that came to mind when I very first started reading Jeannie's Demise uh, was something that happened uh, around the same time, right toward uh, some of the events that happened at the end of the book. Uh, which was a big pivotal mayoral election, uh, which pitted a new challenger, this guy, William Holmes Howland, uh, who was a pretty powerful figure in Toronto already. Uh, his father had been a father of confederation uh, and he himself was the old leader of the temperance society. So when he ran for mayor, he made ideas of morality a central part of his campaign and his platform. Uh, and in fact, his campaign slogan that was coined uh, became something of a nickname for Toronto that still gets used today. It was Howland who called it Toronto the Good. I'm sure you will be shocked to hear that Howland's concept of what was good uh, wasn't exactly an inclusive or progressive idea of morality. It was very conservative, very British, and very Protestant. Uh, and that's a vision for Toronto that I think you can trace back right to the very founding of the city in the late 1700s. It was founded by a British governor, John Graves Simcoe, who was a veteran of the American Revolution who fought against the revolutionaries. So his vision for Toronto uh, was a city that was gonna be so thoroughly and successfully British uh, that the Americans couldn't help but get jealous uh, and beg to be let back into the British Empire. For Simcoe, uh, morality was going to play a very central role. He said that all just government is founded on the morality of its people. Uh, and for Simcoe, just like Howland a uh, century later and so many people in Toronto throughout its history, that meant a very specific thing, this idea of a very British, very Protestant morality. Uh, and I should maybe mention uh, that even people very close to Simcoe weren't exactly following that strict moral code. Uh, 
Uh, his own secretary, Thomas Talbot, was spending a suspicious amount of time alone with Simcoe's wife, Elizabeth, uh, sharing romantic moments together. Uh, his own attorney general, John White, was having uh, extramarital affairs with married women uh, and eventually got caught up in a sordid sex scandal uh, the, so, uh, so big that it killed him. Uh, he was challenged to a duel and shot dead. Uh, but that sort of British Protestant vision for Toronto and Toronto's morality uh, was one that was very much picked up uh, in the decades and centuries even to come. And it's something you can still see at work in Toronto in so many ways. Uh, and throughout the time of Jeannie's demise, uh, in particular, it was being forced by one of the biggest, most powerful groups in the entire history of the city, the Orange Order, uh, which Ian writes about. Uh, very interestingly in the book, uh, a group that had been imported from Northern Ireland uh, that was ultra British and ultra Protestant and very anti-Catholic, uh, that both enforced that vision of Toronto the good on its population at the same time that they ensured that when that code was seen to be broken, that it wasn't their own members who would be paying uh, the deepest, most heavy price. Uh, so there are countless examples through the 1800s that sort of echo that. So in the 1840s, uh, the mayor of Toronto, Mayor Bolton, was found uh, to be the landlord of a brothel on King Street. But when neighbors who went to him to complain about the noise, uh, thinking that once he knew what was happening there, he would have it shut down, uh, he turned them away and said he could do whatever he liked. Uh, in part because he was mayor, but also because he was from one of the most privileged old settler families in Toronto, and because he was one of the most powerful members of the local Orange Order. And indeed, when the neighbors did go public and the big scandal broke out, it wasn't Mayor Bolton who found himself on trial. Uh, it was the Black man who ran the brothel who found himself on trial and found also that the judge presiding over the case uh, was none other than Mayor Bolton's own uncle, and that Mayor Bolton himself would be sitting next to the judge uh, as his associate. It's not exactly uh, a city that was always consistent and fair in handing out justice, uh, and those who weren't part of the elite, uh, who weren't Protestants, who weren't British, and who weren't men, uh, found themselves on the receiving end more often than not. Uh, another big scandal broke out about 10 years later, I think, uh, also involving the Orange Order and another brothel on King Street, which happened on July the 12th, which is the big day on the Orange calendar when the big Orange Parade would take over the city. And uh, a bunch of firefighters uh, headed down to the King Street brothel to celebrate that night where they got into a big brawl with some clowns from a traveling circus that was visiting from the United States. Uh, and the following morning took revenge by organizing a big orange mob to head down to the fairground, uh, attack the circus and drive them out of town. And again, the firefighters weren't the one who's paid the heavy price because they were all orangemen and all the officers in the police force were also orangemen who all developed conveniently hazy memories when it came to crimes committed by orangemen. Uh, and Ian's done a wonderful job in Jeannie's demise of exploring how some of those dynamics play out uh, in the case of Jeannie Gilmore uh, and how some of them interestingly don't. And I think it also uh, sets up very interestingly uh, really the next century of history in Toronto uh, where you can see threads that start in the story of Jeannie Gilmore uh, because uh, William Holmes Howland did win that mayoral election on his platform of Toronto the good uh, and his promise to crack down on what he saw as vices. Uh, and uh, created an entire new part of the Toronto the Police Department uh, called the Toronto Police Morality Squad that was charged uh, with the task of cracking down on what uh, they saw as vices, which included drinking and sex work and um, uh, homosexuality. Uh, they're said even to have once shut down a play in Toronto because uh, two of the actors on stage shared a kiss that lasted too long uh, and was too immoral to be allowed to continue on. Uh, 
uh, and they would have power in the city for another century to come uh, until just a few decades ago, really. So that I think a lot of the history of Toronto in the 1900s can be seen in stories like Jeannie Gilmore's, uh, that over the course of the 20th century, uh, one of the big stories in the history of Toronto, I think, is uh, people struggling against that old Victorian morality, uh, even Georgian morality, uh, and trying to dismantle it in favor of a vision of Toronto that would be more inclusive, uh, more equitable, more democratic. Uh, and I think uh, Jeannie Gilmore's story and the way Ian tells it in the book uh, does a great job of filling in one story that fits into that grand narrative of Toronto and reminds us uh, of issues uh, that were dominating uh, the city back then, even though uh, so many of those stories end up going untold uh, and getting lost into history uh, and helps remind us uh, both of the importance of that back in the 1870s and some of the ways it echoes in the Toronto of today. Hey, thank you very much, Adam. Um, talking about contest and conflict and cruel ironies of uh, Toronto the Good. That was very, um, very helpful. Um, I'm now going to turn things over to Carolyn. Thanks very much. And thanks for including me in this, uh, in this discussion. I very, very much enjoyed the book and I really would urge anyone uh, listening to this, participating to please, uh, please take it up because whether you're a history buff or interested in the class dynamics of Victorian Toronto or in the history of women's oppression and the struggle for reproductive justice, abortion uh, access, uh, it, uh, it, it paints an extraordinary picture, I think, that uh, I do believe will have, uh, have an impact on the, uh, on, on, on the struggle that we're still involved in. And one of the things that struck me as I was first reading it was um, something that I had heard from a physician a long time ago when I was first getting involved in the abortion rights movement in probably the late 70s. And if I remember properly, his name was McLeod, which would give a sense of his Scottish background and perhaps was a, someone who came from, uh, from the stock that was active and involved in the history and creating the history back in, uh, in the time uh, that this took place. And he talked about how uh, prior to 69, and I won't go into all the details of different abortion laws in this country, but before the uh, Trudeau government put the, an omnibus bill, bill forward and, uh, and opened up to a degree abortion access, he said in a, in, a, in a hospital that he was associated in the East End of Toronto, rarely would a weekend go by that a woman would not come in uh, from a botched illegal abortion. And that was in the 1960s. Uh, and not that all of them died by a long shot. Many of them survived because they had a hospital to go to. But he talked about it and how he and others in the medical profession, as, long as, as well as the women's movement, became quite committed to changing that horrendous situation that, that they, 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 they saw there. And what he also said, and I think what this book uh, brings out as well, is that it was the most vulnerable women who were so often uh, uh, put at risk through uh, the backstreet illegal abortions. Uh, because uh, the way he framed it was, if you, if you had resources, if you were more upper class, a higher income woman, you could usually find a doctor, and certainly in the 60s, the procedure was much safer than it would have been in this time, uh, who could do it in a, in a reasonably safe and antiseptic manner. But it was the, uh, the vulnerable women, the low income women, the women who may be immigrants to the country, whomever would be the young women with no place else to go, who would find the backstreet abortionist who would do it for a little bit less money and uh, who were so often uh, the ones who paid, uh, paid an ultimate price. And I, and I think that uh, in reading, um, in reading this, uh, this, this really interesting book, you get a, a real sense of that as well. Uh, because uh, Jeannie, who was a, a young woman in service, and uh, and the others that spoke of, uh, you know, they 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 were women who didn't have a tremendous amount of resources. They didn't have money, and we know that, or we think, if 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 uh, if the story is as is told, uh, who the who the person was who paid for this abortion had more resources, etc. But it, it, it was women who were vulnerable, without resources, without a lot of options, who often paid the price that the genie paid, and if not death, you know, severe, severe problems. And it didn't mean that everyone who went to an abortionist like uh, Arthur Davis uh, 
uh, died or was seriously uh, injured through the process because uh, I'm sure that was not the case. And uh, it's pretty clear that numbers of women went and went through the process and went on and, and lived their lives. But it was a huge chance to be taken. And uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that struck me as well, and you're absolutely right, uh, Adam, when you talk about the, the, the Orange Order, and this was, a, this was a city that was run by the Orange Order. There's no two ways about it. And, uh, and the fact that uh, Arthur put the, uh, the, the Masonic uh, pin on his lapel when he was in the court and talked about going to uh, the celebration of King Billy and all of that, um, it, it showed that he was trying to show that he, he was a part and parcel of this order, even though he did what he did. I think the book pointed out that uh, maybe uh, a fifth of the city of Toronto was, uh, was Irish Catholic. Uh, you had the, the the huge divide, and there was a virulent anti-Catholicism, and uh, it was an immigrant city in many senses. People from Scotland, from Ireland, etc. Uh, and it points out also there were there probably were Indigenous people, but very few. Black people, but very few, and uh, immigrant peoples, but who who uh, would not have spoken English as their first language. But the dominant, as you pointed out, was the Orange Order, and then a smaller uh, a smaller uh, Irish Catholic. Uh, 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 part of the population. But nonetheless, the Orange Order had its perspective and it was very firmly against uh, abortion, uh, any access to abortion at all. And so did the Catholic Church. And the Archbishop, as I think you saw uh, noted in, in the book, said something to the effect, the slaughter of the innocents. And I certainly remember that in the whole campaign that we, uh, those were that we, we, we raised. And my own background is Irish Catholic. And uh, the Orange Order, I won't even go into all that business, but uh, I'm very, very familiar with that from a, from a different world. But um, that, uh, but they had the same, absolutely same perspective. And it was young, poor, and uh, working class farm women who, who paid the price. And, uh, and, and this, is, this is hugely important as we, uh, as we see uh, abortion issue, uh, you know, raising its uh, head in different parts of the world. And I think one one of the things also because um, the debate it's still it's still there it's still there in this country it's still there in the southern United States and other places, but when you go through and you read the autopsy reports and what these women went through and the agonizing deaths that they that uh, that, that 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 they 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 uh, had to go through. Uh, because of the unsterile uh, uh, the septic situation, the conditions, the septicemia, whatever it was that they may have in the end succumbed to, uh, and, and the degradation to, to, to the body, you know, uh, found up on Bloor Street in a hastily made coffin, uh, not even clothed and uh, available to be seen by, by whoever it was, the night watchman, whoever was walking by and saw, I mean, indignity. Uh, it was extraordinary. And, and I think that uh, bringing this uh, to light in, in, you know, as it, as it took place in, in, in Victorian Toronto is so important because there's very little. I mean, we talk about illegal abortions, we talk about what that meant, and it's, it, it becomes alive and real. And, and one can, I, I think, very much uh, when one reads it, you see the huge, the, the huge risk that women took the cost that women took, and why the uh, the uh, I, I suppose the, uh, the, uh, the 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 courts were quite harsh, death penalty right off the bat, but also because as 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 you stated there, uh, in some juncture, at some point in the, in, in the book, that uh, people were becoming more tolerant of abortion. And, and that couldn't be. And, and we can go into all of the, the, the you know, the, the, the analysis of women's oppression and what that means, not being allowed to have reproductive freedom, not being able to have control of one's own body. Uh, all of that is critical and affects all women. But one can probably assume that it is, a, you know, a, a, as, a, that, that uh, if you were more upper class, you could potentially have access to something that would be somewhat more safe, though in those days, it, it was hard to say it was a long, it was 100 years ago or more, obviously, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, it, it was the women who were uh, in the lower part of the class divide, if I may say so. But the other thing that I think is so hugely important today um, Sometimes we can become quite uh, 
content well we have a reasonable access to abortion in this country, not everywhere, uh, not all provinces. Uh, you can look at New Brunswick. Uh, we have what, um, 200,000 women without status in a city like Toronto today. Where do they go if they have an unplanned pregnancy? You look at what's going on in the United States, particularly in um, some of the Southern states, but not only Ohio and others, where this, uh, uh, this anti-abortion by stealth, you know, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, chipping away. And you have great victories like happened in Ireland a few years ago, but you look at what's going on in Poland right now. And, you know, it, it, a government that is so incredibly right-wing and is even trying to take away the right to abortion for a woman who is subject to rape and uh, incense, et cetera. But what it has done, and I think what's so hopeful, is that it's unleashed a huge movement that is going beyond simply, and I don't, I shouldn't use the word simply, but the, the right to abortion and, and women's right to control our, our own bodies, but is shaking uh, the foundations of that government. How that will go, we don't know. I, I'm on a, a, a call next week, a Zoom type of thing with some Polish women on the very question. So I, I think that this book, uh, it just brings alive a period in which women uh, struggled and suffered. And, uh, and I think that struggling and suffering in, in, informed so much of the, uh, of, 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 of the, uh, the movements that came up later, the movements that uh, saw what had happened, understood what had happened and realized we ha have, had to fight for change and continue to fight for change. And I, I think the book brings the reality of that. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a theoretical debate. Uh, people's lives are at stake when you, what, are, are there gonna be more restrictions? Are there not gonna be more restrictions? What does it mean? Uh, would, would we take away OHIP funding? And the varying things that have come up at varying junctures by different right-wing governments across, across this country. So I, I, I think it's a, a huge contribution and it's a contribution to the ongoing struggle we've got for, uh, for women's liberation and, uh, and, and reproductive justice for every woman. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much, Carolyn, and thank you for so eloquently speaking to why the subject still matters uh, matters so much. Um, so at this point, um, I wanna thank all the speakers and wanna open it up to um, the participants um, out there. Thank you very much for coming. And I've got some questions that I can uh, pose. Um, well, some of them are posed for Ian. I also invite panelists to, uh, to address them as well, but, uh, and I encourage people to, um, to send in um, more of your questions. So the first question, which came from Louisa Del Judige, who, who's in Los Angeles. Thank you for uh, joining us, Louisa. And her question is about the abortionists. And her question is, you know, were any of the Davis's actions progressively motivated um, or you know, were, were they just out to make money? So Ian, do you wanna address that? Yes, um, well, sad to say, um, uh, there's not much uh, good in the heart of uh, Arthur Davis when he's on the stand and is asked, you know, why did you do this? And he's given the option of saying something like, well, you know, I felt sorry for the woman. She was in distress. I wanted to relieve her anxiety, you know, something like that. He said, I did it for the money. I was in this for the money. He was very blunt about that. Um, and he was so irresponsible the way he drank heavily and still conducted procedures. Um, I mean, this was really bad. Um, his, his partner, Alice, uh, a much more sober individual, a much more likable individual. Um, and I think she showed some compassion for the women. Um, uh, you know, she took care of the convalescence of women who'd had procedures. Um, they had their convalescences right in uh, the home of Arthur and Alice Davis. And uh, as far as I can see, there's not a lot of evidence, but she seemed to have been more caring. She certainly seemed to, um, as far as we can tell from the evidence, uh, address Jeannie's questions. Jeannie asked Alice whether the procedure was dangerous. And Alice said, absolutely. There's always a risk in these cases. 
And uh, Jeannie then supposedly said, according to Alice, well, I've got to do it because I just can't face my father, the minister. It would be so shameful for me to do so. Now, I'd just like to say that um, this is one case and it's uh, the great bulk of the book is about the one case as, as uh, I said and everyone else has been saying. There is a chapter, however, where I look at 15 other cases that took place in Ontario over a 40 year period, uh, beginning with Confederation in the 1860s. Um, and really what I found by looking at those other cases where a woman uh, died and there was a, 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 a charge brought against people who were believed to have caused the death through an abortion, um, that there was tremendous variety and uh, you know there were male abortionists, there were female abortionists, there were ones who were in it clearly for the money, but there were also people who seemed to just be helping their neighbors and uh, who felt very sorry for women who got into trouble and uh, wanted to help out. Um, and at least, you know, that's what the evidence seems to suggest. And that would include some licensed physicians who were pressured by uh, patients uh, who were in uh, huge distress and begged and begged for an abortion. And it appears that some of these uh, licensed physicians um, rather gave in. It wasn't what they wanted to do, but they gave in uh, to help their, uh, their patient. So there, there are a variety of stories. Uh, Jeannie's particular story is a pretty grim one when we look at the, uh, the, uh, the goals of uh, the abortionists. Okay, thank you. Would any of the panelists want to uh, speak to the issue of the abortionists themselves are not a homogenous group and they may have differing motives, uh, differing contexts? Well, maybe I'll just say it's Carolyn here. I noticed Robin uh, Schwartz asked about midw midwives because midwives were often uh, the women who uh, would be, uh, uh, you know, would be providing the procedure and and doing so mo most probably in a, a much more caring way. And I, I would say that even Dr. Morgenthaler, who did this, I mean, he put his life on the line, went to prison, etc. He was often accused of doing it for the money, which was absolutely not the case. Uh, you know, he did it to change the law and make it much more accessible. But but. I, but I think the question of midwifery, you know, is, 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 is a piece of this as well. Yes, I was, I was rather surprised that when I looked into these uh, cases where uh, charges were laid because a woman died um, as a result of an abortion, apparently, uh, that no midwife turned up as, mm -hmm. as uh, the abortionist in any of those cases. Um, and, and I don't know what that means. I don't know whether... Uh, they were uh, better at hiding things or it was uh, less likely that someone would die in their care. It's, it's very hard to know in the ab absence of direct evidence. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Robin just wrote to say that they probably knew the women's bodies better. So I think, okay, I'm going to move on to an, uh, an historian's question. Uh, this comes from, uh, Jim Ritalik, who's a colleague in the history department at U of T, uh, who says he can't, can't wait to read your book. Uh, but he did wonder about um, thinking, uh, uh, he was interested in you know, the notion that we, we know so little about Jeannie, but of course we want to make Jeannie you know, an important part of this story because it's, her story is so important here. And how did you think through or talk with your editor about you know, how much, how much space to Jeannie? Uh, how do you allow her to disappear, you know, into the other stories that you tell? To what extent were you trying to, you know, juggle, juggle these things as you, as you try to write up, you know, as Karen said, you were writing a number of stories and weaving them together in this study. But Jeannie, Jeannie uh, uh, is at the center and yet we don't know as much about her as others. So how did you deal with some of that? Yeah, I was very aware of that problem for the writer. Um, and it's something I addressed briefly right in the, at the start of the conclusion of the book. Uh, 
uh, you know, I point out that, that genie sets in motion everything that happens. Uh, and yet we know so little about her. Uh, you know, I have one letter that um, she wrote and uh, it was eventually uh, printed in the newspaper because of her death. Um, and that's the only direct evidence we have from her. There's nothing else at all. Everything else is uh, how people described her, what they said about her. And now we have a number of perspectives on her, from her father, from uh, uh, various friends, uh, from her employers. Um, so we get, you know, we get some sense of her from that sort of thing, but it is uh, rather disappointing uh, uh, that there's so little direct evidence about her. Uh, and the story inevitably gets more focused on the abortionists who are on trial after all, and the trial is a big part of the case. And then their confessions are very significant. Um, this gives us a, a, a whole lot of evidence of a sort that um, we don't have in most of the uh, abortion murder cases. Uh, so uh, their confessions, uh, we get the sort of inside story, at least as they wanted it to tell it, uh, in so far as they wanted to reveal what actually happened. And then we have um, um, uh, the subsequent trials that occurred as a result of their confessions. Uh, I don't really want to go too much into that because it gives too much of the story away. And I think if people haven't read it, there's a certain uh, 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 crime novel kind of feel to the book that, that leads you to wonder what's going to happen next. Um, but yeah, the whole um, problem with uh, the lack of evidence about Jeannie is, is an issue. And perhaps most disturbing for me um, is the fact that we never learn uh, how it was she got pregnant, under what terms she got pregnant. Uh, you know, she might have been raped. Uh, she might have had an affair with her employer who impregnated her. Um, that seems like the most likely scenario, given the very small amount of evidence that uh, um, uh, shines a bit of light on this uh, uh, matter. But it uh, it is disappointing that we we can't we cannot know and we will never know uh, what actually happened to her. Okay, thank you. We've got uh, more questions coming in, including I'll um, say hello to Bettina Bradbury, who has joined us from New Zealand, um, and actually asks, I guess, this is such a grim, uh, a grim story in many respects, but she also asked, uh, what did you like best about this project and researching and writing this project? Hi, Bettina. Great that you're with us. Um, I think what was most interesting was I was learning all the time um, and I had uh, the opportunity to follow all kinds of leads. And as I've said, there hasn't been much written about the social history of abortion. We have good work that was done a few decades ago on the law in abortion, uh, Constance Backhouse's important works. Uh, but as for the social history, uh, you know, there's very little understanding of it. So I was really learning all the time. This was a new topic to me and new evidence I was coming across and that, that was exciting. But there was all kinds of byways I went down in writing this book. Um, you know, the night watchmen were important in this story because uh, they saw this uh, coffin-like box, uh, new and heavy, being removed from the Davis's house. There were two different night watchmen on different beats who saw the, the coffin being moved about town uh, under the cloak of darkness uh, uh, at midnight. Um, and uh, uh, I didn't know anything about Night Watchmen in Toronto. I've never seen anything written about it. Uh, so I had to research that. And I did find in the, uh, uh, the records of the police department a little bit about uh, the Night Watchmen, how the police uh, uh, force uh, kind of supervised these Night Watchmen who were paid by um, businessmen who wanted their um, neighborhood protected. Um, and um, I found out about detectives in Toronto at the time. Um, 
um, the detective force was still quite new. And again, it hasn't been written about uh, um, at all. And uh, so I, I researched about detectives and how that worked. Um, and, uh, you know, I just was constantly learning new stuff as I went along. And, and uh, that, that was, uh, uh, kept me very, very interested. Uh, I, I beavered away on this book, you know, uh, for uh, a very sustained period because it, it just kept me going. There was no lull as there often is in research when you've seen too much of the same thing. Um, it, it was a fun project despite the, uh, the horrible story at, it, at its heart. Sometimes I feel a bit guilty saying it was a fun project, but I'm talking about the research process when I say that, not the subject matter. Okay, thanks. We have another question from uh, Donna Gabacha, and um, thanks, Donna. She says, can you name the father and the man who likely paid for the abortion and discuss his position in the context of the time and place? Um, yeah, this gives quite a bit away. Um, um, in their confessions, the Davises, or at least Arthur Davis, um, I should say more specifically, um, he uh, names the man who paid for and arranged for the abortion, who is a, a, was an employer of Jeannie's in Toronto, uh, a fairly wealthy businessman owned a lumber yard and uh, a woodworking factory uh, right in the center of town. Um, and uh, he was uh, uh, in municipal politics for many years. He was almost certainly an orangeman. And uh, um, so he's, uh, he's an interesting character who uh, 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 is charged with murder uh, after the confession of the Davises. Um, this man uses his uh, social and economic privilege to uh, uh, hire the top lawyer in uh, uh, Ontario and he gets a, a very, what turns out to be a very effective defense from him. Um, nevertheless, he's quite uh, uh, put to shame in the city. Um, people uh, uh, think that he may well have been guilty as charged. And uh, he chose to leave town after um, he got off. And he goes out to the West Coast and... Uh, uh, makes a whole new life for himself and lived for quite a long time afterwards uh, uh, in Seattle and then in British Columbia. Okay, thank you. Yes, so he got to continue to live his life and live a new life. Um, I want to ask if any of the panelists want to speak to the issue of the men, the men who sometimes called perpetrators or the men who pay for the abortion and so forth. Anyone want to speak to that? You want to put your hand up I will. Not, okay. Okay, so we can move on to um, the next question. This, this one is from Paul Epperl. Hi, Paul, thanks for joining us. And he asks, uh, this is about Arthur Davis. Uh, is it possible that Arthur Davis claimed he did it only for the money because there would be less opprobrium in being seen as purely mercenary than in being judged morally complicit? Well, uh, it's very hard to know. I do think um, a little bit of sympathy was shown in the press for abortionists who said, I was only trying to help. You know, uh, in one case, I've got a mother who provided an abortion for her daughter. And, um, you know, uh, she looked kind of, it seems such a sad situation she was in. And I, I I, the press doesn't say a lot. It's hard to know what most people were thinking. Of course, the evidence is very slim, but there might have been some sympathy had Arthur Davis said, uh, you know, I was, I, I, I'm in business, yes, but I'm also doing an important service here that's very much needed. And I hope, um, I hope uh, to, to help people. Um, um, and he's an interesting character too, insofar as, you know, he actually had all kinds of medical books and all the latest medical equipment. He was 
apparently trying to do a, a good job in his profession um, at the same time as he was, he, he was out to make money. Okay, a question from Andre Levesque. Hello, Andre, thanks for joining us. Um, and she says, in my research, I found evidence of male abortionists uh, who raped the woman in order to uh, lower the fee. This will also be our last question as we're coming to the end of our hour. That's very interesting. I uh, saw nothing like that for the Ontario evidence uh, uh, I looked at. Um, uh, but one can imagine that uh, if these uh, abortionists were, uh, you know, uh, out for the money and not all the women who came to them could, of course, af afford the fee. I certainly found evidence of a lot of uh, bargaining around the price. Uh, the women trying to get it done for less and the male doctors sometimes um, giving in a bit and, and sometimes not. Okay, thank you. So there, uh, there are various questions from people who are asking about what's next, but they're just going to have to wait for what's uh, next in terms of your own uh, research and writing. Um, I'm going to thank everybody and I'm going to turn things over to uh, Karina. Hi there. Hey, uh, so I'd like to just thank everyone for coming. Um, again, lovely turnout. And thank you so much for um, putting so many questions in the chat. It's been a really stimulating discussion. And uh, I also want to thank all of our panelists and thank Ian for writing the book and Franca for moderating so well. So it's it's been great. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, don't forget to check out the book on our website, just to reiterate, it is 30% off from now till December 25th because we're running a holiday sale. So it's a great chance to stock up on it. Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'll sign off now and just uh, thank you all for coming. <laughs>